Good morning to you all. Everybody, good morning. We're a full house. Some people still coming in. Many, many friends, colleagues, partners. Good morning. This is the real start of an exciting couple of days, falling prices, rising risks, and many other exciting issues. We have a very special uh, <coughs> opening session. We, in the spirit of what we want to do in the next couple of days, of having something very interactive and relying on the enormous expertise around the room, we're going to start first with a voting survey, which we're going to use a special technology, because the most important thing we want to draw is, is yourself, the expertise from around the room. Um, so, <coughs> I, our, our deputy director, Sunita Kaimal, is going to uh, explain what we're going to do. It's going to take a few minutes in terms of the technology first, but then we're going to get into it. It's just for questions. <coughs> then we'll show very quickly a few data points, and then we'll go to a very exciting interactive panel <coughs> with the, the special guests and speakers today. And, and we're going to then turn to the audience. We're going to have an exciting morning from then on. I want to welcome you all, and let's get going immediately with a very interactive spirit that we have here. I'm very pleased you're here, and we're going to spend a very special two days together. Sunita. Thank you so much, Danny, and welcome to you all. A few brief announcements before we put you to work this morning. Um, first of all, we're of course pleased to have so many of you with us in person. However, we also wanted to reach our many partners and experts around the world who couldn't make the trip today. And so as such, this room and all sessions in this room are being webcast. So please note that there's a few implications for this. First of all, anything that is said here can be heard by anyone who is tuning in around the world. By sitting in this room, you consent to being filmed and or recorded. Should I give you a moment to walk out just in case? All right. <laughs> also note that statements made in this room are therefore fodder for Twitter, beware. We hope those in you, of you both in this room but also watching online will actively tweet your impressions, your thoughts, your reactions, and of course, memorable quotes be sure to use the hashtag resourcegov. To those of you who are tuning into the webcast, we very much invite your remote participation. You can send us any questions for our speakers via Twitter using the hashtag as well as our handle at NRGI Institute. We will try to take at least a few questions from Twitter in each of the webcast sessions relayed through our communications director, Lee Bailey, who is going to be monitoring the feed. Sessions that are taking place in the other room in the Mary Sunley Theater are not being webcast. Those sessions are taking place under the Chatham House rule. If you have any questions about that, please just speak to the session organizer. We really want to make all sessions as dynamic and interactive as possible, and so we are going to take questions at the end of each session. But part of the ambition here is for all of us to get to know one another better. So I very much encourage you, before you make your statement, to introduce yourself very briefly, your name and your affiliation. We also want as many people to be able to contribute as possible, so please do keep your comments brief and your questions very much to the point. Of course, since, as Danny noted, one of the primary purposes of the conference is really to hear from you, and because we as NRGI believe in the power of data, I hope you will bear with us this morning as we run through some survey exercises and we really put our commitment to data to the test. I'll walk you through it very slowly, so even with jet lag, it should be pretty manageable. And at minimum, we promise to keep you awake. So normally, when you come to a conference, people say, put away your, ta your tablets, your computers, your smartphones. We're going to do the opposite. Please take out your smartphone, tablet, laptop, whatever you feel most comfortable using. And we're going to use that to access a website for online voting. First of all, in your welcome packet, you will find instructions 
for the Wi-Fi and also for voting. If you already have access to the 3G or 4G network, then you do not necessarily have to log into the Wi-Fi. I'm going to give you just a moment to take out your phones. Make sure you're connected. And note, for those of you who are connected to the Wi-Fi, you would have been handed a piece of paper that has your individual username and password that you need to log in. Once you are online, you're going to go to the website live.voxvote.com. Okay, raise your hand if you're online and you are on this website. Okay, I'll give you a few more minutes. And once you're on the website, please enter the event code 19683. And if your neighbor looks like they're struggling, please lean over and help. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. OK, how many of you are online and on this site? Good to go. Raise your hand. Closer. Okay. All right, I'm going to give you 30 more seconds and then we're going to test this out. We really appreciate you being our guinea pigs, by the way. I just have to say that. Mm. Wi Fi access here, use mine. Okay, we're going to do a dry run with the first question and see how you did. So the first question is, what region are you originally from? North America and Europe, South and Central America, Asia Pacific, MENA, Africa, or Eurasia? So select the appropriate one on your phone or tablet. Raise your hand when you voted. <laughs> okay, so we got 48 of you to vote. <laughs> you can see we, uh, we have a certain bias in the room at the moment. Or that may be a bias for those who uh, are on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's not clear. Okay. There we go. So 64 users this round. Mm -hmm. Getting there. Okay. All right, not bad. I know it's early, so that, that was pretty good. Um, all right. So that's out of 68 users who voted. Those are percentages or the numbers? The numbers. 46 from North America and Europe, and then second from Asia Pacific at 8%. Want to refresh one more time, see what happens? Okay. <laughs> We're progressively getting more balanced in the room, <laughs> so that's a positive. Okay, let's try another one. Question number two, how would you describe your affiliation? Civil society? Media, policymaker, donor, academic, or private sector? 
Well, then you just get to pick. Mm -hmm. And you're civil society now. <laughs> International organizations or civil society? <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you voted. Okay. There we go. So nearly 35% from civil society, second highest academics, 21.7 from the private sector, and 11.6 policymakers. Can you refresh and see? I think that's about where we are now. There we go. Okay, so now that you guys are all professionals and old hat at this, we have two real questions for you that are really at the heart of our conference this week. First of all, does the fall of commodity prices represent an opportunity or a risk to governance for resource-rich countries? Is it an opportunity, a risk, or neither? Both we, we figured it would be 100%, so <laughs> we're trying to be a little provocative here, you know. <laughs> Don't think too hard, you have two days to talk about this. Okay, raise your hand if you voted. Good? Okay. Survey says... Uh, See, we have a bunch of optimists in this room. I like that. <laughs> Good, we're up to 80. You want to try one more time? 83. <laughs> okay. And our last question, and then we'll let you guys rest after this endeavor. Um, since joining, how have countries in EITI fared in terms of civic space? Significant improvement? moderate improvement, no change, moderate decline, or significant decline? Okay, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you voted. Are you abstaining? <laughs> There you go. Okay, moderate improvement, 54.2%. Um, no change, 22%. Second highest. Great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you guys indulging in this exercise. And I'll hand it back over to Danny. Thank you. Well, this is not only the power of data which is going to run through the whole conference, but more importantly, it's a base, the power of drawing on, on the expertise and on the opinions, in this case, with about 100 of you, but we also do that with the data that we collect from hundreds of thousands of different stakeholders, from multiple sources, 30 or so, and also from experts around the world. Uh, just very quickly, it's an appetite wetter and to set the scene for many of the discussions I had, and there'll be many more other graphs in other sessions and so on, just to show what the governance indicators suggest uh, over the past dozen of years or so, where we see first that the non-resource rich countries, not surprisingly, have a higher level of governance quality than the resource rich or resource dependent countries should say resource rich, whether we look at voice and democratic accountability, government effectiveness, political stability, regulatory quality, rule of law, or control, or control of corruption. Um, oops. Okay. And, and now, there are the significant variation across regions which will also be fleshed out in a number of the panels that are coming out, and not, not only across regions, but within regions. If one looks at voice and democratic accountability in the Middle East and in Eurasia, Central Asia, that's much more challenged than in Latin America, 
or in Sub-Saharan Africa, which are ahead. Um, but in terms of uh, control of corruption and government effectiveness, the reality is a bit different. So it's very important also to, to flesh out those, those differences uh, that, that emerge from that. Over time, we see a very troubling trend in terms of governance, and particularly on voice and democratic accountability. And that relates to the question on civic space. What is happening on civic space? In fact, uh, the data from all these stakeholders and from all these sources suggest that while on non-resource rich, the average has been improving, even though not very dramatically, in terms of civic space, measured in terms of voice, democratic accountability, which includes freedom of the press, in, includes freedom of association, and so on. In re resource-rich country, that has not been the case. If anything, there has been somewhat of a decline, and particularly so in, in uh, some of the recent years, and includes countries that joined EITI. So we see a clear trend, countries in EITI, and EITI has many, uh, <coughs> many achievements and many good things in terms of disclosure and so on, but those countries have not exhibited improvement in civic space to the contrary, while many other countries in the world have seen some improvement. So there's obviously an issue, and that relates to the voting we just did with you. On government effectiveness, in terms of the countries which are resource rich, the picture is, is, is stagnant, some improvement on non-resource rich country, and in terms of control of corruption, very similar trend to that on voice and democratic accountability. In somewhat upward swing on non-resource rich and uh, not so for resource rich countries. In fact, if anything, there has been a deterioration in terms of, of corruption. Uh, very, very focused in terms of resource, natural resource governance, and particularly in terms of transparency and accountability, we have the measure from hundreds of experts that we do at an RGI, which is a resource governance index. The sobering news is that this is a snapshot of 2013. Next year, there will be the next measure. The, the sobering news is about 80% of the world, <coughs> the vast majority of the 58 countries, Port have still a very significant challenge in terms of transparency and accountability in the natural resource sector itself. The silver lining is that there's a 20%, it's a set of about a dozen plus countries that are showing that yes, it can be done. And quite a few of those are emerging economies, including in Latin America and some in Africa. But the overall picture is quite, quite sobering. So this is just to give an appetite wetter in terms of the challenge that we face in terms of what's ahead. And without further ado, we will go now to a panel that's going to be led, provoked by <coughs> Diary Woods, the head of the Blavatnik School of Government. And you have many other eminent positions that I'm not going to, to read for the sake of time and informality, but it's on to you, Nairi. If anybody's used managing what was on the screen, I could do with that index Hello? on the screen because I wanted to say what's wrong with it. Well, I, I was very shocked, Danny, that uh, Mexico and, and Brazil run higher than Alberta, Canada, and New Index. Is that true? No, no, it is true. This is Brazil after the Petrobras scandal, Mexico, and we do better than Canada. <laughs> Come on, it's a message. message of Excellent. So, thanks a lot. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're off for a good panel already before we've even out of the gates. Um, I'm Nairi Woods, uh, founding dean of the School of Government here at Oxford. This is an exciting time to be building a School of Government. The challenges that governments across the world are facing are well represented 
on this graph, to quote the former president of Mexico, if Brazil and Mexico are that high on the list, what on earth is happening in the other countries on that list? Um, this morning we're going to probe the, the big question that frames this year's Natural Resource Governance Institute conference, which is, is, this, is, is the current state of commodity prices and commodities in the world posing a risk or an opportunity to countries across the world. Most, well, I think about 60% of you said that you think it's an opportunity. Let's explore that on this morning's panel. We couldn't wish for better uh, participants. I'm going to introduce them um, one by one as I introduce them to address this big question. So we're going to start with um, Ernesto Zedillo, the former president of Mexico, who is chair of the Natural Resource Governance Institute's board. Um, at Yale, he has so many titles that if we put them all together, it's a doctoral thesis, so we won't do that. No, don't um, do that. <laughs> <laughs> we're very proud at the Blavatnik School to um, have President Ernesto Zedillo as one of our very first distinguished practitioners, somebody who exemplifies the kind of public service that we hope that those coming through the school will aim towards. Ernesto, is, are, we, are we in a world of risk or opportunity? Obviously a bit of both, but what for you is the most important thing for this group to be bearing in mind? Well, I think we have to acknowledge uh, in the first place that the uh, super cycle is over and that uh, should make us think about uh, the possibility, the reality of one missed opportunity and the possibility of two other missed opportunities. The reality of a missed opportunity is that a number of countries which uh, enjoy a historically uh, positive external shock by virtue of that uh, commodity cycle probably wasted that opportunity to have a real takeoff in their development. Of course, uh, it is uh, easier to point out to the worst cases of that miss uh, opportunity in my own continent, probably, not probably, in all certainty, Venezuela. It is very hard to find in human history a country that has enjoyed such a huge positive external shock and ends up in the economic, social, and political condition that Venezuela is today. And this is not uh, to make a judgment about uh, whether or not I like President Chavez or the present president. I think this is absolutely objective. Any of your students could run a very simple exercise of how much of a positive external shock Venezuela had and what would be the growth and development opportunities that could have been financed with the right policies with that uh, positive shock. And of course, you will conclude that far from that, uh, it is a total disaster. We can point to other examples. In Africa, I think Nigeria is a, a case in point, and I think Nigeria is about to go through a rather difficult and dramatic process of uh, adjustment, the consequence of having missed uh, this great opportunity, not having improved its governance, uh, in particular resource governance, and now I think we will see the consequences uh, of that. And probably Russia is uh, another example where uh, most of the time where President Putin has been in office, uh, Russia had an extremely positive uh, external shock, and now they have come to the realization that, uh, I hope they have come, or they are beginning to come to the realization that there was a, a missed opportunity, and unfortunately, in lieu of uh, addressing the fundamental issues, now other kind of geopolitical destructions, uh, distractions are being introduced into the picture and that has become, I would say, dangerous 
for Russia, dangerous for the world, uh, and with uh, many other uh, consequences. I think we can also mention other examples in the Middle East, uh, but I don't want uh, to go into any other details. I rather want to talk about the two other opportunities that may be missing as we speak. One is, of course, the opportunity to fix uh, relative prices of energy in particular, or in particular energy derived from fossil fuels. Uh, the size of these uh, subsidies are huge. The opportunity cost of those resources is enormous in terms of uh, other development uh, opportunities. And right now that the price of oil and other uh, fossil fuels is uh, lower than they were, considerably lower than they were in the previous 12 years, uh, this will be a moment to undertake very serious uh, reform uh, so that uh, those countries can have uh, not only greater resources to, fi uh, to fix what in some cases are rather weak uh, positions, but in other cases to use those resources to enhance infra infrastructure and other development uh, opportunities. The third uh, miss opportunity that we may about to witness has to do with uh, climate change. Uh, I don't need to preach to be converted. I would assume that most of you had gone through an elementary course in economics. You might have heard about Professor Pigou, uh, who wrote uh, back in the 1930s, but his thinking continues to be extremely or perhaps much relevant uh, than ever. And all of us, if you have gone through that elementary course in economics, you should know that the best way to correct the very uh, terrible externality that we are causing by consuming uh, too much uh, fossil fuels that are a cheap cause of uh, global warming would be to impose a carbon tax, right? Uh, we know, on the other hand, that the world has been insisting since uh, Kyoto on uh, a different approach. Well, certainly pricing, but in a rather indirect way through a global cap and trade uh, uh, system. And the experience of all these years tell us that this approach has failed dramatically. And yet, we continue to work along the same approach with a view to have COP21 in Paris in early December. And I can make with some certainty a uh, prediction. The optimistic prediction is that a lot of champagne will be open at Paris saying that we have a new agreement on climate change. Second prediction is that a few weeks later, uh, people who are professionals in this field, meaning that they run this uh, uh, integrated assessment general equilibrium models, will run their models incorporating whatever is agreed in Paris and will come out with the conclusion that uh, whatever was agreed at Paris will not put us in a trajectory to correct the very dangerous trajectory we are on it. So, I think basically reflects that we have uh, neglected what must be done, that is to say to internalize the externality caused by this uh, emission of uh, greenhouse uh, gases by putting an explicit carbon tax and evolving towards harmonized universal carbon system that will be the only way in which we can stop uh, this uh, madness. Uh, so these are, I think, the three, the three missed uh, opportunities. I think the academic and also uh, the advocacy uh, community uh, have a, a, a big role to play. Uh, well, on the one hand, to analyze why that opportunity was missed in the long uh, commodity cycle, and what should be done to prevent uh, total failure or to have the two big uh, missed opportunities 
that uh, I have uh, mentioned. Thank you hugely, uh, President Zedillo. So countries have wasted the commodity price uh, boom. Not all of them. They've right. no well, caricature the position, but they've, they've Norway wasted, did well. They've wasted the boom. We need. They need to get rid of subsidies on fuels, and they need to set carbon taxes on climate change. So there's there's a position to start with. President Zedillo singled out Venezuela, Nigeria, and Russia. Do we have anyone here from any of those three countries? Nigeria. Nigeria. <clears throat> with that, Nigeria. yeah. Charles Saludo, did, would you like to say, you know, just a very quick comment? You've, Nigeria has wasted the opportunity. Yes, no? Yeah, Nigeria was an accident waiting to happen. Um, I, I think ours is a textbook example of how not to do it in terms of the waste. I mean, um, and the tragedy is that we've been through this experience over and over. Uh -huh. yeah. And but with little or no learning. You've now got a new government. What do you hope? If you could have them do one thing, what would that one thing be? Huh? One thing? <laughs> <laughs> we'll explore the other things during the week. But Come on, we are at Oxford. They do it like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that will be a full session on Nigeria after this, and we'll have a chance to explore uh, some of the other things. But I think... Um, in this particular, uh, talking about mismanagement and the, the, the opportunities, ours is a whole agenda of a transition to a post-oil economy. And uh, that agenda is not just about one thing. It's going to be a full menu of what I might call almost like tearing the system down and building afresh. Uh, because uh, we seem now to be caught in a cosmetic ad hoc you know, patch up mm -hmm. on the assumption that the shock is temporary. Mm -hmm. As always, we've always treated this kind of shock as temporary, and the response is very ad hoc, mm -hmm. and that um, it is time for Nigeria to realize that oil is over, mm -hmm. and we've got to begin a new life. Mm -hmm. And I think a full agenda is what the new government, if indeed <laughs> would the change that we voted for is to endure and to be sustainable. Um, it's going to be literally like tearing up the, uh, the entire uh, house and build a new foundation. Thank you very much, uh, Charles Saludo. So um, the man on my right was nodding vigorously partway through that. You will know him, Professor Sir Paul Collier. Um, we're very proud to have Paul as the, the first founding chair in the Blavatnik School of Government, but also Paul, as you all know, founded um, the Center for the Study of African Economies and was motivator in chief of the Natural Resource Charter and, and um, much of what we're discussing today. Um, Paul, is there any chance of re, you know, if this is the wasted opportunity for many countries that President Zedillo's outlined, you know, what, what lies ahead? Oh, well, let me, let me try a line that. Peter Eigen certainly won't like, but um, it starts with the question, what's the best run economy in Europe today? And the answer is kind of obvious, Germany. Um, but then, then comes the hard question, why is Germany the best run economy in Europe today? And I give this talk in Germany sometimes, and forgive me, Peter, but I see, a, when I say it in Germany, I see a, a sea of faces with little bubbles over their heads saying, because we're German. And that's the wrong answer. Um, the right answer to the question, why is Germany the best run economy in Europe today, is because it used to be the worst. And what happened in Germany was social learning. Crisis and disaster produced social learning. Charles Saludo has pointed out Nigeria's been through the same cycle twice. And if you don't do social learning, you know, the tragedy, of course, it's the cliche, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And that's what Nigeria's done. That's what Venezuela's done. Um, and so the, the, this is an opportunity, a completed super cycle. We've never had such a big commodity super cycle, never had such a big opportunity for poor countries. It has been largely missed, opportunity. It's a vital matter, whilst that is recent phenomenon, 
that there's a stock taking, not primarily internationally, but in countries, but both the international community and the societies themselves have to face the fact that it's gone wrong and think, why did it go wrong? Um, and um, the, the basic answer of what went wrong, I want to use this to illustrate um, uh, two things. Let, let, let's, let's just take um, three countries here. Um, uh, what looks pretty good. Um, <laughs> wait a minute. There's <laughs> um, Ghana. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, amongst the African countries, Ghana, pretty good. Zambia, very close, pretty good. Oh, well, it's not on your Just push the green button in the back. Okay. So, um, what looks pretty I'm all, I'm all right. What looks pretty good here? So, Ghana, right up there at 15, just amongst the Africans. Zambia, the other country, right up there. Right? Top of the Africa class. Ghana and Zambia. Um, we have to go quite a long way down the bus before we get uh, Botswana, where I was last week. Um, does that make any sense at all? Do we want to turn Botswana into Ghana and Zambia? If we look at using the opportunity of the natural resource super cycle, Botswana did really very well. Um, as, as it had done in the past, it saved when things were good, accumulated a lot of assets, it had a, a, a temporary very bad shock, and it dissaved sensibly during that temporary bad shock. If we turn to, Ga to, to Ghana and Zambia, high on this index, they are both stories of disaster. In both countries, they had the biggest opportunity they've ever had. Ghana discovered oil. Zambia had a big copper boom. Both were driven into macroeconomic crisis even before prices crashed. Both of them had to call in the IMF for emergency programs. What did they both do? They both went and borrowed heavily on the international sovereign bond market and slammed up public sector wages. Borrow and spend. So um, this index um, emphasizes accountability and transparency. And that is a huge misdiagnosis of what went wrong. Um, and uh, so there are, there are two learning things that have to happen. In the, in the, in the resource-rich countries, the big, the, if we had to say one big mistake, what was the biggest mistake? It was not doing what Botswana did, not accumulating assets. As Charles Saludo said, you've got a temporary set of revenues, and you've got to build the future with those revenues. And instead, both Ghana and Zambia drank the future. In effect, they just slammed up current consumption, wages, and what have you, borrowed. What they left to the future was liabilities instead of assets. What Botswana left to the future was assets. And what Nigeria should have done, of course, is what Charles said, build the, the non-oil future of Nigeria. So the, the lesson for countries is that the story is first and foremost about assets. The lesson for the international community is that we just did a misdiagnosis. We thought that the problem was overwhelmingly transparency and accountability. It wasn't. It wasn't. Is that a problem? Of course it's a problem. Is it the problem for natural resources? No, it's just not. And so the, the bulk of the international effort, things like EITI, went into this emphasis of transparency and accountability. As we saw from our question, has it made it better? There are many people saying it's, things have got badly worse as saying it got a lot better, right? I mean, EITI was the wrong 
focus. Right? I mean, I did my best for, for, to promote EITI, but it's, it's, it's a subsidiary set of issues. And if you just have that and nothing else, it actually, I think, makes things worse. Because in country, that emphasis, that message is heard as your government is a crooks. This is what happened, I think, in Ghana and Zambia. The message was you're being run by crooks. Well, maybe they were, but what the, what the government then did, first of all, that there was an explosion of expectations. The message, you know, this, this is hugely valuable, but you're run by crooks. So explosion of expectations, not enough delivered. So what the government does in desperation is go and borrow and then spend on flashy stuff that everybody can see, higher wages. And so the transparency and accountability message, not matched by other messages, pushes you in the wrong direction. That's why the key institution for the future is not EITI. It was a misdiagnosis. That's why we've got energy. We need to focus on the full economic decision chain not on accountability and transparency. There's a load of organizations focused on accountability and transparency and nothing else. We have got to focus on everything else. Right? So I think of our organization as beyond EITI. Um, what went wrong in Ghana and Zambia, while we definitely don't want to turn Botswana into Ghana and Zambia, is that city, above all, Ghana and Zambia didn't build an informed citizenry. And that's a really hard thing to do. Botswana has built an informed citizenry over the decades. And it started very early on with good presidents. Sheila will doubtless be able to tell better than I do. But there was a careful attempt to build, build understanding among citizens. Things like prudence. We're poor and therefore we have to carry a heavy load. Right? It was saying be patient. Right? That was the psychological foundation for being to, able to build up a pooler fund. Um, so the, 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 the key focus, the key battle that went wrong over the super cycle, it's not the only battle that went wrong, but the key battle was the battle to accumulate assets. Um, that's the battle that has to be won next time. It'll only be won by citizens gaining understanding that that's the key issue with natural resources. Now, there's one unfortunate additional twist which Botswana doesn't help us with. Botswana, very small, landlocked country, not many domestic opportunities for investment. And so it made a lot of sense to build uh, the Pula Fund, an international financial fund basically the same model as Norway. Should Charles be leading the charge on that in Nigeria? Not really. Nigeria is the opposite. It's a huge population, coastal location. It's a, it, it, what it desperately needs is productive jobs, which you won't find in the natural resource sector. It's productive jobs outside the natural resource sector. And that means there's a massive need for domestic investment in Nigeria. And oil, over the last 20 years, over the super cycle, oil should have financed that. Gas should have produced electricity, and oil should have financed investment. And as part of that, the capacity to invest properly, the investing in investing agenda, should have been vigorously pursued. And the tragedy is it hasn't been. And that's, that's the job for the next generation of Nigerians now. But they're going to do it without all that uh, oil and gas money. Um, the one, uh, I'll, I'll close on a more hopeful note, which is that um, poor countries have got huge undiscovered natural resources. Yeah. As of the millennium, uh, per square mile, poor countries had only discovered one-fifth as many natural resources as rich countries. That's not because poor countries have got less, it's because they spent less on, uh, on, on discovery and prospecting. Um, so poor countries' future 
is going to be resources as well as their past. There'll be new opportunities, but the social learning which leads to the harvesting of those opportunities is absolutely fundamental. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. A robust challenge for the, uh, both for the president of NIGI, to whom I'm going to come in a second, and for everybody in this room. Um, but a positive message. If you are the worst, whether it's on the previous index, which if we could have the previous index back up, that'd be good. Um, if you are the worst, you can learn from history and become the best. It's not about formal accountability and transparency. We're going to come to uh, Danny Kaufman on this issue, obviously, um, but that resources pose these huge new opportunities. Paul singled out Ghana and Zambia. Do we have anyone from Ghana or Zambia here today? No, so we're going to yeah, pick... Yeah, ah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, can, we have a, can we have the uh, microphone up to... Um, uh, spent up there. Just um, <clears throat> so so Paul's point was that this is you know this is serious mismanagement of a great opportunity. Just a, a, a quick response. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, my name is Akuto Ose. <clears throat> I was a minister of state in the Ministry of Finance before oil discovery. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're off the hook. <laughs> but but I, I was the leader of the EITI program in Ghana, so I'm, I'm partially responsible for pushing the transparency agenda. I'm now a member of parliament mm -hmm. and the ranking member of the finance committee mm -hmm. who helped uh, bring the act, the PRMA act into being. Yes, Paul is right, I think. We all recognize that. But there's still enough time. We are only five years into oil discovery. So there's time to correct these imbalances. But it, it must take a very serious consensus in terms of the national agenda. We don't have a long-term development plan. We have done several medium-term plans on political cycles. And I think this is one thing that is lacking, that we need to begin to push on the two key parties. I'm a member of the opposition, of course. And sir, can I ask you one question? Yes. Is there anything that you now wish you'd done as Minister of Finance? I didn't have oil then. <laughs> no, I know, but is, is there any measure that in hindsight you wish you'd put in place then that might have protected Ghana from what happened subsequently? Uh, it's a tough question. Um, at the time that I was there, we were going to an election cycle, uh, 208. There was very little we could do. We were building the, as it were, the governance institutions for the, for the, for the previous five years. But in every election year, there's very little room to take on serious things. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if in 208, now, if I were, it would be different. And what would you do now? What's the one thing you I, I would do? I think this <laughs> issue about building assets, um, if I look at, we have a, uh, an institution called the Public Interest Accountability Committee. If you read their reports, and you see the kind of spending that has gone on in the last four years, mm -hmm. if we don't put a stop to it, we are in trouble. Mm -hmm. As you said, we are consuming not only the money borrowed from the e e euro bond, but oil revenue. We're just consuming it away. And, but it is difficult in, in opposition to get people to see that, mm -hmm. because you are seen as being political. But we must fight that. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get a chance to do that coming uh, after 2017. Thank you very much, sir. It's lovely to have you here. I'm now going to turn to Danny Kaufman. As you all know, um, Danny is president of the Natural Resource Governance Institute. He's done an extraordinary job of bringing together two initiatives and building a, a, a forward-looking vision for this uh, project. As you know, before, before he engaged in this, Danny was for a long time at the World Bank and was really the author and instigator of the Good Governance Indicators, which became a separate you know, um, project in their own right. Um, Danny, 
big challenge from the president of your board and one of your, the pillars of your organisation. They're saying this index, the jewel in your crown, is not really worth very much. Partly because it seems to tell us... I didn't say that. <laughs> Come on. And no, I have an brief. explanation why we are there. <laughs> so, no, no, but, the, but I think the thing is that it looks counterintuitive to us. You know, why, why would we put Brazil and Mexico ahead of Canada? Um, but no, Alberta, also, Alberta. But, 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 Alberta. Um, but, but Paul's challenge is a deeper one, that there's been too much focus on formal transparency and accountability, which actually was the birthright of this organisation, and not enough focus on the other things. I think Paul, for the sake of provocation, was going further and saying transparency and accountability have diverted people from the underlying important things. But, Danny, to you to respond. Is it... Are you going to give up transparency and accountability now in the face of Paul's onslaught? Mm. Well, they are both eminent members of our board, so do I have any choice? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> the answer is yes, uh, we have a choice, and uh, we, including with the, um, with the debate in the audience. Let, let's unbundle this. Let's look for the sake of discussion, debate, about three or four fallacies that have come up already from, from our eminent uh, speakers. Um, one, the notion, I really like what Ernesto mentioned, the super cycle is over, and you declare that, and I hope that's broadcast very loudly, because a common fallacy and that's, is, is, has been to assume that periods of high prices are usually permanent, and when prices are low, they're usually transitory. And they, so there's this, this, this bias, exuber, uh, bias trend towards exuberance. The second fallacy is to have assumed that during the booming years of high prices, one would see all these reforms, which so much work has gone by Paul, many colleagues, together with us, including the charter, so all the technical advice. There's so much more knowledge of what needs to be done and that somehow it would happen and the countries would see the light and take the opportunity of the booming years. When, if one looks at it from a perspective of incentives, political, economic, financial, that's not what studying governance for so long is the message there. In fact, the flip side of that is that maybe the opportunities right now, because of low prices, because of crisis, and that's why I really like the responses earlier, and many, many of you saw it as a real, real opportunity. So let's consider, consider that. And, and uh, Ernesto mentioned, well, there are opportunities, the carbon taxes issues, subsidies, but there are many others. The whole issue of state-owned enterprises that need major revamp. Um, anti-corruption. It's a major issue that for political correctness reasons sometimes it does not get sufficiently integrated into that. Now it's a time and uh, citizens are clamoring to do something about it and to integrate it more fully into this. Now to get into a third uh, fallacy and, and there is an element I agree with Paul which is um, when just focusing too narrowly on a particular issue within a sector, it's not going to solve the problem in the sector. First and foremost, one has to see the broader environment. And that's why I showed earlier the, the graph of what was happening in governance in general with rule of law, with civic space, voice and accountability, and so on. What happened? What happened in EITI? And I, I'm biased, of course. I sit in the board, and I have enormous respect. Peter Eigen is there, the founder, and, and so on. I think that sometimes global initiative, especially when it's so innovative because it's multi-stakeholder in a way that had not been done before, basically civil society, the private sector and government sitting around and, and agreeing on an issue, it started very narrowly and very focused on not just transparency and disclosure, but disclosure of reports about payments made by companies to government. Very narrow, but it was so important to get that door, that window slightly ajar. And that's how initiatives start. I totally agree, and I was one of the early critics to say that's not going to suffice. But that's part of the dynamic, that's how it started. Let's recognize about a year and a half ago, there was a sea change in terms of enormous work that went from many around this room, and the standard, the new standard 
became basically approved by the board and now it's been under implementation of EITI, which is much broader issue has been covered, including state owned enterprises, including um, issues of <coughs> related to transfer payments, subnational, and so on, which was not in the early stand. Here I start departing from, from, from Paul. Um, the issue of accountability needs to be unbundled from the issue of narrow transparency. I call it zombie transparency if it's just disclosure of papers. But, and then the information that comes, the very rich information that comes from that disclosure, if a journalist or a civil society leader tries to use it and, and <clears throat> put it up, whether in the media, on a blog, talk to the press and so on, and if those people are arrested, if there's no freedom of the press, if there's no ab ability of having freedom of expression, like many countries there, then there's no accountability. The problem is that transparency in the narrow sense underwent major improvement in the disclosure sense. But, and that's why it's very important to look at this broader picture, but the civic space narrow. So while technocratic improvements are taking place, in terms of what's happening on the political reality, increasing repression, particularly an attack on freedom of press. So we are not there yet by, by many, many miles in terms of accountability issues. So we have not yet put to the test the notion that we have done transparency and accountability, and yet we don't yet see the fruits because the accountability part is still missing. Of course, this is the last point where we totally agree. Once we have made much more progress in accountability, if we focus only on that and its transparency and accountability, that will not suffice. And that's why it's so important to focus on the whole decision-making change and frameworks like the charter, which we have adopted as an organization and we're working with countries in implementation is critical and one has to look into the fiscal regimes in terms of how to invest the funds, many of the issues that Paul is talking about. That's absolutely crucial. And that was not, and there, it's absolutely right on this more narrow index, which is resource governance index that did focus on transparency and accountability alone. One of the sessions, in fact, it's going to be <coughs> in, in lunch, but it's going to feature a discussion on the next resource governance index, which will come out in 2016. The aim is to integrate much more of the chain precisely because we agree that this was narrow was on transparency and accountability. But the most important point I wanted to, to, to put on the table is that we are not there yet on accountability. So progress has been made in narrow transparency, but if it stays just there without accountability, it's what we call zombie transparency. But I think in a way the heart of this debate is that some of those who originally pushed for transparency and accountability assumed that if you got that, there would be a sort of invisible hand that would then sort out all the other problems. And I think what Paul and Danny and probably Ernesto all agree on is that what we've learned is that that's not the case, that you need accountability most definitely, but that you've actually got to work to make all those things happen. There's no magic process that you unleash simply by presenting the data and, and, and making sure that it gets into the hands of, of citizens. So I think that's agreed. But, Danny, the next challenge for NRGI is surely, in the words of someone I was speaking to yesterday, NRG, you know, EITI, this is all, that's all in the past now. It's with China that you need to build, you know, new sort of principles and practices and standards. And I know you've been thinking about that. So give us a hint. Like, where, where do you see that relationship for NRGI? Uh, well, <laughs> we're ready and we'll get some... We, we, we'd be happy to, to, to make some links. I think it's very, very important to, to link up more with, with China, which we know has, has not been in the EITI initiative. Um, one, and it's again the whole EITI early notion of opening a window and trying to expand. China is watching very closely what EITI and also NRGI and others are doing in Myanmar, for instance. So by, by the work that is going there, um, uh, that, that interest uh, may, may be there. Increasingly, also, uh, China is becoming aware 
that the, these notions that we're here for, of good governance, mm -hmm. um, in the long term it pays. Mm -hmm. So the, the issue of responsible citizenry and how to operate in, the, in these countries. There are, there are many analysts and some policy makers that are looking very closely as, at these new frameworks. They've been in, interested in, in our diagnostic frameworks in the past and they studied it very much in detail with much, much rigor. So I think it's really important to keep working at it and they look at the data that we produce and in, engage with, with China much more. But that's, that's one, obviously, an enormously important country for various reasons. But at the same time, I think it's really important, the discussion that took place before, is to focus now on certain countries that are absolute priorities in terms of the challenges they face, at the same time, the opportunity. And that's why I'm so pleased that you are here from, from Nigeria. It's a, an incredible moment right now uh, for Nigeria. Ghana was also discussed. Indonesia, it's incredibly important, and so on. And, and these, because there is a sense of urgency and there is a sense of crisis, citizens are demanding more and are asking, where did the money go? and they're much more concerned about corruption issues in their country. I see it in my own country, I'm, I'm from Chile. Chile is usually, like Paul got up and spoke about Botswana, I would have spoken with a lot of pride about Chile and explained many things about Chile. I'm particularly proud, even if a bit tired this morning, because we just went to the, to the semifinals in the America Cup in soccer, and we hope in a few days for the first time uh, Chile will have maybe a, cu a cup. But in terms of what Chile has accomplished, the Chilean miracle is not an act of God. It's very hard work, technocratic and politically. Yet, we've been enmeshed in a major political and corruption scandal because of political finance over the past two or three months. But the institutions are reacting to that. And because of the situation and the fall in the commodity prices, the Chileans and the demonstrations and the citizens are demanding much, much more. And, and no country is immune to those issues. It's how these institutions react to that. So there are countries where there's a real opportunity now for those reforms. And let's not miss that opportunity of working with them. And that's what we want to do. Thank you. So what a menu they've put before you. Um, got to get governance right. Got to get the economic strategy right. Can't forget climate change in all of this. I'm going to take some questions and very brief comments from you. I'm going to take a cluster and then come back to the panel, just so we can get a sense of what, what your burning questions or issues are. So could we have some microphones up, up to here? Yeah, over, over, over to here. Yes. Do, do I need to stand up or just sit down? Uh, but please stand up. Do you tell right. us your name and well, where, yeah. where you're My from? My name is Satya Yuda. I'm the Deputy Chairman of Energy Commission from Indonesian House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. And uh, my question is very much on the chart that you just explained regarding the uh, Resource Governance Index. It seems to me that you only distinguish between, uh, differentiate between non-rich uh, resources country and rich resources country. But in reality, it's actually it's not because of they are rich or they are not non-rich. Mm -hmm. Basically, it depends on the type of the government itself. If the country with rich resources, but if the type of government is uh, very much authoritarian, it's quite difficult to impose the ATI initiative into the society. So my question is basically why the uh, NRGI is not putting on the, on the very much uh, focus on the type of the government instead of only non-resources, non-rich non resources and rich resources. Great, because, thank you very yeah, much. Because very much driven by the type of the government. Terrific. Thank you. Great, so why, why the index doesn't focus on types of government? Um, across, across here, the gentleman there. Yeah. My, my question is to the, uh, I'm Mark Beer from Oxford Policy Management. My question is to Paul, but it's obviously the whole panel. I don't know if it was an oversight or convenience, but I also spotted South Africa lying in between Botswana and Ghana on your list. And so therefore I'd like you to perhaps apply the same approach that you did in terms of the analysis of the ones you picked on to South Africa and give us your opinion on that. Great, thank you. 
Uh, just behind you, yes, right there. Yes, um, my name is Jargal. I'm from Mongolia, independent media. Question to Paul on that social learning issue. I completely agree with the concept that transparency and accountability are not that something that makes completely everybody happy or better. But the social learning thing is going to be very expensive. That's what the politicians are afraid of, and they're doing all things to borrow money more and more. Mongolia is exactly like these countries who is borrowing, not uh, cutting the expenses. So question is, in which way that social learning can be made effectively in a, a country, resource-rich country like Mongolia, for example? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Can we go right up to here? Yeah. Hi, my name is Albert Zuf. I come from Cameroon and I work for the World Bank. I'm the manager for macroeconomics and fiscal management for East Africa. Um, two questions. One, Paul, you mentioned uh, Botswana being the right uh, example uh, to follow the Norwegian model uh, because of limited investment opportunities in the local economy. I do agree. But all across Africa, all across East Africa, uh, most countries are actually being advised by the Norwegian to follow the Norwegian model. And there is a huge infrastructure of the Norwegian cooperation advising all these governments to just replicate the uh, Norwegian model, even in cases where domestic investment are extremely uh, uh, are needed. So the question is, um, you know, are we in a position at this point to actually start engaging with the Norwegian or doing something about it if we believe that's not the right advice? Second question, Botswana. You know, as long as we all agree, as much as I agree that it's a great example, I'm wondering if we're actually not overstating that success because, um, you know, yes, Botswana has saved, but has Botswana really built assets? That's a question, and I'm wondering if we shouldn't actually make the distinction between savings and investment, just like the IMF is starting to do. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you actually just compare uh, development outcomes of Botswana with the same level of income per capita of countries, you benchmark Botswana with countries outside Africa, it's not that much of a success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Down here, please. The lady here. My name is Zainab Osman, a doctoral candidate in international development. Um, my question is for uh, Professor Collier. You emphasized on um, the need to accumulate assets. And for me as a political economist, I think about the incentives of decision makers and the fact that in countries like Nigeria, um, Ghana, Zambia, etc., which are uh, democracies, you have leaders who face competing demands from different constituencies. So you have a leader who's newly elected and you know, their priority is not necessarily on, on uh, you know, investing in a sovereign wealth fund, which for all intents and purposes remains invisible to the ordinary man or to the citizenry. It's incredibly important, but then for many people it's something abstract and far and distant. So how do policymakers go about building assets in such contexts when there are so many demands? from citizens. Terrific question. And then if you pass it just behind, to the gentleman behind you. Joe. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. My name is Joe Ingram, and I'm the former president of the North-South Institute in Canada. I wanted to comment on Ernesto's uh, <coughs> reference to Alberta falling below Brazil. As you know, for the first time in 44 years, uh, earlier this year, the conservative government in Alberta was voted out of office. Right. and replaced by a social democratic government. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was because of broad dissatisfaction with the way in which uh, the economy was being managed and the over-reliance, not just by the Alberta government, but by the Canadian government at large, on oil and gas mm -hmm. as a driver of economic growth. And part of that opposition also came from First Nations people, 
Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, that through their right to free prior and informed consent, they were preventing the government, both in Alberta and at the federal level, from proceeding with major pipeline projects. They basically said enough is enough. So I think that may be part of the reason that you see uh, Alberta lying below Mexico and Brazil. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Right, let's, let's move to some, some answers to these uh, questions. Um, so, Dani, the Resource Governance Index, the um, gentleman from Indonesia said, you know, why doesn't it focus on different kinds of governance? Um, rather than going too long into the composition of the index, is there anything you could tell us about where you're hoping to take the index and what it will measure in the future? Well, um, this was obviously a, an appetite wetter, and I didn't expect all these very specific questions. The, the index is very much in a report. It's all over the web with all its components and many of the answers to that, uh, to that, that question. Let me just say that the issue of type of government, and particularly extent of democratic versus non-democratic government, is absolutely critical and was part of the earth, and that's why it was so important to also present the broader picture of what's happening with governance in general, what's happening with voice and democratic accountability. And having that analysis, that's something that, that we do, and it's absolutely uh, critical. There is no secret that there is such an association between resource richness, and particularly rich in oil, and non-democratic governments. The causalities and the reasons are great political scientists here. That will be part of other sessions and we, we can discuss. So that's one, one uh, uh, part of the riddle. But the other issue is that this aspect that you mentioned is crucial in the context of the discussion we're having about accountability. And that's why it's so important to stress again and again that we are so far from being there in terms of progress on accountability because civic space in so many countries is being further restricted, particularly during the boom years that happen, and particularly in oil countries. We don't, in hydrocarbon intensive, we don't find the same trend in mining intensive countries. So yes, absolutely crucial, and that's something that, it's not just in the next index, and this index, it's about resource governance, which will be, every time we improve it, and will be improved for 2016, but it should not be looked in isolation. That's why we looked at also the broader governance indicator from around the world, and one has to look about what's happening with rule of law, with democracy, with all those issues much more broadly, not just what narrowly is happening in the sector because the solutions to the sectoral, to the issues in natural resources in many countries are not mostly going to come just from tweaks within, within the, the sector, but it's in, in the much broader environment issue. But okay. Botswana is an illustration of that. And just one comment, the Joe Ingram, uh, the great, great uh, comment about Canada was going to mention that we found certain um, real problems in terms of what's happening in some of the accountability on, on, on the governance issues. The civic, index, including civic space. Yeah, including that, and that's why what happened po politically. So um, there is some very useful information in the 2013 index, but obviously it's one snapshot at, which was done in 2012 for 2013 of one issue, but it's not. Uh, it's not the whole picture. We're going to expand it, but even when we expand and improve it, one has to complement this data, and that's always what we do as analysts with other data sources that are much broader. Uh, Thank you, Danny. So um, the, uh, there's another cluster of questions which are really aimed at you, Paul, saying, look, governments face strongly competing demands to use their resources. Should they all be adopting the Norwegian model you know, what's the alternative for ranking and deciding among these different priorities? Yeah, so um, I mean, accountability to the ill-informed um, creates a problem, it's not a solution. Right? So if, you, if you've got an ill-informed population, just emphasizing accountability creates a problem, it doesn't solve a problem. <clears throat> Um, uh, if we, and that's illustrated um, in Mongolia, 
as the gentleman said very clearly, I mean, that, that um, Mongolia had accountability, it had very tightly fought elections, and what that did was, was drive um, governments into, into the big spend, you know, catastrophically big spend, um, as, as, in, as in Ghana and Zambia, but even bigger. Um, so the, the failure in Mongolia was exactly what you identified, it was a f failure of social learning. To, and, and, and it's hard for governments to build informed citizenry on natural resource issues. South Africa, somebody asked about South Africa, and in South Africa, the tragic, there, it's been a big missed opportunity, um, but, the, but there it's rather distinctive that um, South Africa's resource-rich economy went through the super cycle, 10 years of super cycle in its commodities with practically no investment in the mining sector. You know, and that, uh, that's, a, that, that's a real tragedy. There was, there was an opportunity in South Africa during the super cycle, as everywhere else, to get a big scale up in, uh, in investment. And that happened in most countries, but it didn't happen in South Africa. And it was just, you know, the, the, why? Because the citizenry just didn't understand that issue <coughs> and how destabilizing the uh, continuous debate over whether you should nationalize it or what would, was. For, for, you know, missed that very big opportunity. Um, the, um, uh, the Norwegian Botswana model of save it all abroad, first let me correct myself, uh, the Botswanans did save abroad, but they also spent a lot at home wisely. They had good social spending on the, the social investments of health, education. Big, big expansion in education. You know, I, I, a couple of years ago, Sheila invited me to do an address at the, uh, for the University of Botswana. And they built, a, you know, they built not just primary education, they built all the way up the system. So they've got a fine university there. Um, so Botswana did invest in the future within the economy as well as building money abroad. Actually, so did Norway. Norway only started saving abroad when they really ran out of all the even halfway sensible infrastructure projects you could think of within Norway. And, um, and whoever said it is quite right that um, it was Albert, wasn't it? That, 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 um, Norway is over-enthusiastically taking its current model of save abroad in a sovereign wealth fund. It's over-enthusiastically taking that around Africa. Um, there's an association, an international association of sovereign wealth funds, and the fastest growing section of that association is African, because the, a lot of African countries are setting up uh, sovereign wealth funds because it's seen as a glamorous idea. Um, it's now a good idea for Norway. It's not a good idea for Africa until it's built up domestic investment. The priority for Africa is building the capacity to do domestic investment well, <coughs> what I call investing in investing. That's the priority for, for Africa. And it, it's, you know, the whole natural resource sector is, is, is dangerous because it's full of glamour. You know, the, the glamour of an oil discovery gives citizens a false impression of wild, wild, wildly exaggerated expectations. I was part of a little group that did a survey of, uh, of Ghana, Ga Ghanaian citizens, a thousand randomly selected Ghanaian citizens last year. Question, um, how much per capita do you think the oil revenues are worth in Ghana per year? The most common answer was don't know. And the rest of the answers you know, would stretch from one end of this room to the other. There's no idea, basically. Um, so Ghana, um, accountability without an informed citizenry. Very tightly fought elections, just pushed you into, 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 into spend. How do you, final comment, how do you build an informed citizenry. Well, Botswana did it. Um, it's, uh, it has to be done by leaders. Leaders have, leaders have to communicate narratives of prudence and building the future. It's not impossible. 
Because, yes, governments have elections, but ordinary people have children. And children are a far longer-term project than winning an election. And so the idea that what are we doing, we are the generation that is responsible for building a better future for children, and we're going to do that through uh, better education, jobs, and so on, um, that's a viable message, but leaders have to give it. If they just go around promising, you know, we'll, we'll put wages up more than you, um, that produces the, the, the Mongolia type of outcome. Fantastic. So one of the themes of this panel has been that when we talk about governance, it's not just about formal transparency and formal agreements around that. It's about having technocrats that actually know and have conduits of information for what would be the best policies, institutions that they can actually use to make that happen, and an informed and free citizenship that can engage and demand of that government better and better policies. President Zedillo, you did quite a lot of this in Mexico as president and before that as Minister of Education. So, you know, we have 15 seconds, and I think you could give the, the solution to the audience <laughs> for countries striving to do that. Well, I, I, I thought Oxford was a serious university <laughs> when you were asked to say something in 15 seconds. No, you know, one size doesn't fit all, right? You have to start from the initial conditions in every country, and that's mean taking into account what is your history, what are the available institutions, and you have to have the political leadership to deliberate with the people and to get uh, this informed uh, citizen, see, and uh, define what are the national objectives in a very honest, transparent uh, way. And one problem with all of that is that uh, nowadays, and also in the past, the temptation of populism mm -hmm. is uh, enormous. It's enormous either to retain power or to win the next uh, election. And that has been a terrible impediment for good governance, at least in, in Latin America, and certainly for good management of natural uh, resources. So I think it is uh, the responsibility of political leaders to elevate the level of debate about uh, what do you do when suddenly you have this uh, oil or otherwise uh, riches and go through a profound process of deliberation with your citizens, with the other states of the power. And once you come to a conclusion, establish the rules, the institutions, and the accountability mechanisms to enforce uh, those rules. One of the mistakes we made in Mexico back in the 70s and 80s, you know, was to, that we discovered these huge riches of oil. And uh, I remember that. Uh, a president of Mexico who said, well, now our problem is how to manage wealth. Uh, and we went crazy, and that was the beginning of the lost decade, not only for Mexico, but for, for Latin America. And this historical experience seems to be forgotten over and over again in, uh, in Latin America and in other parts of the world. I just wish that an organization like uh, Energy Eye, you know, works, continues working very hard to not only recover those historical failed experiences, but also, you know, try to disseminate what we believe are the fundamental principles that, if well applied, will prevent those kind of situations. One uh, element that was practically missing, conspicuously missing, from this discussion at this table when we speak about uh, transparency and accountability, which is something which I think is very important, is to say that the issue is much bigger than that. Unfortunately, we, ha we have, and Tony is there, one of the uh, founding fathers of the National Resource Charter, is that now I think we have been able to distill, you know, 12 principles which, uh, where we believe if those principles and all the analytical and historical foundation that are behind of those principles 
are really applied, implemented, studied, disseminated, socialized, then I think we have something to work with, uh, uh, with governments and by governments to deliver the right results to the people. Thank you very much. We are going to close the panel there. Can you join me in thanking our panelists? For Thank you.